Ooh, I can hear myself. We're going to be talking about bootable containers. We're going to do a deep dive into an image-based operating system. Uh, so my name is Dan Walsh. I'm a senior distinguished engineer at Red Hat, and I've been working on bootable containers for the last uh, about eight months now. So for those who haven't seen me present in the past, whenever I present, if you ever see text on the screen that is in red, you have to read the words. Oops, there was a couple there. Okay. Um, so, anyways, let's look at the problem. So, this is talking about general uh, operating systems, uh, the way we do package based operating systems right now. Uh, we have uh, difficulty managing Linux at scale. Okay. So, usually you're managing a few laptops, a few servers. Um, it's not a problem, but once you get into tens to twenties to hundreds of machines, you know, how do you manage that at scale? Um, how do you manage infrastructure drift? So you might start out with, say, 100 machines all running the same operating system, but over time they're going to drift and they're going to become, um, you know, differences. Right? Someone's going to SSH into a box. They're going to add additional packages. They're going to modify the SSH keys. They're doing something on that machine that's going to cause all the machines to start to drift apart. Um, we have a very different way we handle day one versus day two of install. So usually you install a system and then you come back and sort of reinstall it, right? You go in with, um, you know, tooling and stuff like that to sort of configure it, reconfigure the machine after you've installed. Uh, administrators are driven to invent image mode. So if you're going to ship, you're not going out to each one of the machines, you're just running Anaconda and picking out packages to install. You're going to, if you're serving 10 20, 30 machines, you're going to have image mode, right? You're going to have, you want all those systems to be the same, to look the same. Um, and so what's happening now is almost all sysadmins in the world is developing their own way of doing some kind of image-based system or some kind of um, golden image-based system. Um, now the problem we have in the industry right now is that there's different tools uh, between ops and dev. So de developers right now over the last 10, 11 years have been taught to do everything as containers, right? So they're all used to using um, container file or, or uh, native, you know, uh, container native format. So it's all the stuff that's going on for Kubernetes and stuff. But operators are doing stuff the same way, you know, using Anaconda and Kickstarts or other tooling for managing the operating system. It's very different than the way that the container techs are doing it. Um, we have different uh, content types of images, so we have different ways of building images. Different, you know, there's lots and lots of tooling around that, and it's all desperate. You know, it's all different. And finally, probably the biggest hurdle, at least when I talk to customers, is the fear up, of upgrades. So, uh, you know, a, any sysadmin who's managing anything at scale is deathly afraid of updating the software. Right, that some, something's going to be updated, and all of a sudden the software's going to blow up in their face. So when the uh, systems blow up in the face, and from a security point of view, you want to have signed and verified images. You want to know that the content in your images is safe and secure, uh, not visible to CVEs, so it doesn't have CVEs, and that it's signed. It came from a trusted third party. It came from Red Hat, or it came from uh, the vendor you expected it to come from. Uh, so when we're making, uh, we're talking about making bootable containers because it's all about the Someone shout out something. Give me, fill in the blank. Oh, ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, I heard that in the back of the room. So it's all about the ecosystem, right? So over the last 10 years, there's been a, a buildup of a huge ecosystem of, of um, tooling for building up um, basically container, the container ecosystem was what we were talking about. We want to use standard container practices and tooling, such as the OCI standards for layering, container registry, signing, testing, GitOps workflow, um, and built on Linux systems. So what we're, what we're talking about bootable containers, we're really talking about taking, taking advantage of all the stuff that's been built over, uh, you know, during the Docker slash 
uh, Kubernetes revolution that's happened over the last 12 years. So all this tooling, everything's been built for it. Um, so we, want, we need to take advantage of that at the operating system level. So uh, again, Docker sort of introduced a revolution uh, back in 2012, 2013 timeframe. Kubernetes came along a couple of years later, and everything in the technology world for, the, you know, for running applications over the last 12 years has is revolved around this infrastructure. So how do we get take advantage of that at the operating system level? We have cloud native development. We have container registries. Right now, um, if you look at you know, uh, the infrastructure that everybody has a uh, container registry in their environment, right? whether it's from you know, Quay from Red Hat or it's Artifactory or Docker Hub, um, all the big cloud vendors have reg container registries. And what is a container registry? Really, it's just a, a website with lots and lots of content that you can have. But the beauty of the container registries is the container registries are also behind their firewalls. So a lot of our customers, a lot of users of this technology don't even want to go out to the internet, right? They want to be able to host this stuff privately. So the, the one common factor that they have in all this environment is container registries. And the container registries lead to things like the ability to sign the images, as, uh, the, the sign the content that's sitting in the container registries. And then it has tooling. These registries have tooling for scanning. So if you look at Quay.io, it has the ability to scan images, right? To look at the actual content of these images and figure out if there's any vulnerable code inside of those, those images. So all that technology has been built up over the last years, and we need to take care of it as, the, you know, as part of the operating system. So what am I really talking about here? We're talking about building the OS as a container using... Oh, no, no. Yeah. Foul language. We call them container files in my world. Okay. Uh, we a few years ago I gave a talk where I put up a swear jar, and any time I said the D-O-C-K-E-R adjective, I always had to throw money into the into. You know, I didn't want to say the D word. Uh, so, anyways, yeah, we're talking about building container, bu building the operating system as a container. It's using the same tooling. So you can use Podman build, you can use Docker build, you can. Uh, use OpenShift builders, things like that. And what we're talking about here is a base image. So in this case, we're looking at Fedora Boot C, and we'll be talking about Boot C in a minute. Um, but this, this, this is a special image. This image includes the Linux kernel. It includes systemd. It includes everything you need to be able to boot up an operating system. And then you can add layers onto that with all the content that you want specific to your job. So in this case, we're installing DN using DNF to install stuff, but I also, you're able to just copy content into this, these images. So they're really, you know, you don't have to package everything as an RPMs. When I gave the, this talk at DevConf, that was like one of the big quotes. Somebody for Red Hat says, you don't have to package everything as RPMs, right? And that was like earth shattering to so certain people. But we're, also, you can start to move your day two operations into day one. So when you're building your operating system, Right? Instead of having to run Ansible scripts after you've installed 100 machines, why not run the Ansible scripts while you're building the operating system to be able to distribute them out? So do your, some of your day two operations you can do as day one. For instance, this example here, we're enabling FIPS mode inside of the build of the operating system as opposed to when it's distributed. Uh, the tooling for basically building these operating systems, same tooling we've been using. So Podman, Podman build, builds the operating system. How do you test this operating system that you just built? Well, you test it as a container. So the first pass of non-testing would be using container technology testing. So you can just run Podman run, and it's going to run the entire operating system. Not the Linux kernel, but everything inside of there, the systemd and all the services files. You can SSH, or you can get into the box, make sure the service is set up correctly. Um, you can actually fire up the whole system into a CI CD system. So when we talk about fear of upgrade, right, it's because you haven't tested the systems well enough. So if I basically have an upgrade to an operating system and I can run it through a, a huge CI CD system to make sure that my operating system is working the way I expect it to work once it gets deployed, I can do all this testing using cloud native testing, open shifts, Kubernetes, um, and any type of CI CD systems, but I'm testing it on the operating system before it gets deployed. 
Um, we talked about container registries. So once I've built my operating system locally and tested it, I'm able to push it out to the container registries. And again, this is an open standard. So the container registries, it doesn't matter which container registry, you can store your operating system on the container registries of your choice. You also can, once you have your operating system built as a container, you can extend it. So you might want to, inside of your company, you might want to build you know, Acme Inc.'s default operating system. And these are the packages I expect, right? These are the security packages I have to have, and I have a, basically a gold standard operating system. But then each one of these is going to diverge, right? I might have a web services. I might have a DHCP service. I might have all database services. But I'm all going to be based off of the same base operating system. So just like the, the revolution that we have for containers, all of a sudden I could just start packaging off of that. Now, if the base operating system of the original image that I built, which I call an SOE here, has a vulnerability, it gets updated, and then I trigger an update to all my systems, just like we do with containers. And once I you know, do that. I'm just going to use the same tools to rebuild my operating system. So I'm going to Podman build again, and I'm tested out again. So I can test to make sure this new operating system works correctly, and I just push it up to a registry. When I push up to a registry, by default, the systems I'm going to be talking about will be watching that registry, and when new code gets to that registry, by default, they will just pull them down and update. So the actual individual systems will just upgrade automatically. You can turn this off, obviously, but we want to get to the point that it becomes no humans have to get involved in your update process. So you could just push to a registry, and all of a sudden, if you trust that the update is going to be successful, then you could do that. So in the talk I gave, this talk at DevConf, we had a stage person named Hans. So now, when you read the red text, you have to do it with a German accent. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I don't speak German, so I really did not understand that, but I think what you were saying is, hey, Dan, uh, up to this point, we've been talking about containers, right? You're just talking about general containers. You haven't talked to, you know, how do, how do I get this thing onto, an, onto the system? How do I boot this thing? And, um, and that's where Boot C comes in. So introducing Boot C. Um, and there's a great singer back in the 1970s, he's actually a bass player, and his name was Bootsy Collins. Uh, we're not talking about Bootsy Collins here, we're talking about Collins Bootsy. Uh, so uh, Co Colin Walters, a, a co-worker of mine, a really brilliant engineer, um, developed, he's uh, the guy that developed o OS Tree back in the day, worked on the core, uh, core OS team and uh, working for uh, OpenShift for the last few years, basically figured out, you know, why can't we just do this, you know, similar technology for containers? Um, so he sort of built the next generation of OS Tree, um, and he called it Boot C, bootable containers. And uh, so I'm going to show you a demo now. So this is going to basically is, is going to show you a general stock system in the cloud um, running package-based, uh, I think it's been running package-based rel. And what you're going to see here is the first thing he's doing, he's going to install Podman onto the machine. So this is just standard RPM packaging. And now what he's going to do is he's going to uh, so he just finished installing Podman, and now he's going to run Podman. But if you see here, this is a special Podman. What this is going to do is, um, let's use this little laser beam and see if this works. Okay, so here, is, uh, here he's running Podman. Um, he's doing some volume mounts into it. But down here, he's running his Bootsy image. So this is the SOAE image that just was installed, right? So this has been pushed out to a registry. And what he's going to do is inside of that image, there's a Bootsy. And so he's running a privileged container, and he's going to run Bootsy install to existing system. So what this is going to do is it's going to download the image just like a normal Podman would do, install that entire operating system as a container onto the system, but then the boot C inside of it is going to replace the running operating system with the contents of the container. 
So, whoop, I wasn't supposed to do that. Yeah, now I'll let it run through for a little further. Try to see. The arrows don't work the way you expect. Don't touch the arrows. So here's running the, now he's running the um, container. He's actually switching that variable name to be the a Bootsy application. A Bootsy image, it's downloading it just like it would download any other image onto the system, and then it's going to start overwriting the operating system. So he's going to replace the stock image that he's running in the cloud with the image that he did. Now he's going to reboot the system. He's showing that it's running that. It's going rather quickly, but he's basically rebooting the operating system. So he's showing that he's running reboot. So once he's rebooted, he's going to be into the new operating system. So he's going to attempt to upgrade again, and it's going to say no. So he did a Bootsy install to the system and actually switched out the operating system from underneath him. Yes? Did you remember I said Bootsy is the next version of OS Tree? Oh, no. So it is. It's a re it, basically it's the same thing. It's a it's the next version of that. Yeah. So RPM OS Tree, uh, what he's talking about is actually doing does similar things inside of OpenShift, and so this is bringing that out to to the masses. Um, Right. There was no OS tree underneath it. Right. There's there's no magic. I could have taken a I could have taken a Fedora image, done this, and switched it into a rel image. Yeah. This is not upgrade. This is this is this is shovel it into the dumpster and then replace it. So we're about to, what, what you can do after you've done this, now you're an OS tree, now if that image gets updated, you can do a Bootsy upgrade and it will now basically live the, uh, the, the OS tree life size style where the operating system will get upgraded and the stuff remained. Yes? Um, so since this is a container, where are we getting the kernel from? The kernel is in the container. So that, remember it said from Fedora Bootsy, that had the Fedora kernel inside of it. I have a CentOS boot C with a CentOS kernel. I have a rel boot C with a rel kernel inside of it. Slightly less related. Um, have you tested doing this with like a kernel image instead of the um, Yeah, we don't get down to that layer. Well, we, again, if the operating system, you know, how, how the machine's going to boot up, what, the, what tooling is going to use to boot up, um, can be embedded inside of that operating, inside, inside of that image. Okay. So that, that just showed a, a demonstration of how you could do this, you know, on, an, on a host by host basis, but you could also do this, you know, using more advanced technology. You could probably use Ansible to go out and, and, and you know, spread this, spread this operating system out, and there's lots and lots of tools to build, build these in the cloud native format. Um, but if you want to start with an operating system, you know, start with a, um, you know, not start with an existing operating system, but install a mach machine right away, um, the team this, that did Image Builder uh, have worked on this as well. So if you've ever played with Image Builder, which is building sort of edge type uh, operating systems, they built a new tool, which is another container called Bootsy Image Builder. And what Bootsy Image Builder will do is actually trans translate this OCI image, this container image, into an actual bootable disk image. Um, so you can create ISOs out of it, but you can also create raw images, which runs on a Mac, or a QCOW2 for running on Linux VMs. Uh, you can run um, 
it'll create Hyper-Vs, VMDKs for uh, virtual machi uh, VMware machines, AMIs for running in the cloud. Um, so I think the last time I looked, it supported about nine different um, output formats for disk images. So you, if you want to just take an AMI and, and put it into a, a registry uh, with, this, with a bootable container, a Bootsy image already pre-installed on it, you can do that as well. And here in uh, Podman Desktop, and I think this is on a Mac, is actually showing this is all built, all this tooling is built into um, Podman Desktop. In this case, he's taking a, a Bootsy image and converting it into both an ARM and a uh, QCOW2, I believe. Um, system, so you can do it all graphically. So you can build these these images very easily um, using this technology. Finally, you can actually do this inside an Anaconda as well. So you can take an Anaconda Kickstart and any raw image, any ISO in the world, and if you run it, the, put this command in your Kickstart, it will ignore the content of the ISO and it will actually go out. Anaconda will go out and pull an image off in an OCI registry and use that as the contents for the install. So you can actually do lots and lots of really cool stuff uh, with Anaconda um, and all the standard Anaconda teams. So if you wanted partitioning tables, things like that set up, this will all work. Um, you could also take the Kickstart files with Bootsy Image Builder and inject them into the ISOs that you're building with Bootsy. So if you want to have a hard-coded Kickstart file embedded in an ISO, you could allow it to do that as well. Day two orchestration, so again, we want you to do more stuff in day zero. We want you to build the operating system, have everything set up, have the Etsy password with all the rules, you know, take your disk of stigs and apply them. Everything, you, we want you to do that at day zero. Um, uh, but through the system, we can actually start to manage your Linux systems at scale. Um, this, because you're now mo moving into an image mode, we've eliminated the idea of, of you know, uh, or at least uh, trying to prevent um, infrastructure drift. And again, because you're doing everything, you're not going into the machines and modifying them after they've been distributed. If you want to modify them, get new updates down, you basically rebuild the systems, push them to a registry, and then allow the systems to be up upgrade themselves using a, a Bootsy upgrade uh, on the systems. Um, so it's going to be a very different day one versus day two experience. Um, we want to standardize on this so that you know the, each individual sysadmin stops building their own image mode, and we all move to a container flow image building. Um, and a lot of these problems that we talked about in the beginning are eliminated. And why aren't you advancing? So where do we recommend that? I don't know why I didn't go to this slide. So a lot of people think of this stuff as being, you know, for edge deployments, right? If you were, you know, ordinarily going to be running lots and lots of edge deployments, but we actually believe that the, this is the way you want to do, if you're going to be doing lots and lots of systems inside your data center that are identical, it's similar that you want to manage that. Um, obviously, we want to move OpenShift. You know, OpenShift has sort of a predecessor to this available. We want, uh, we plan on OpenShift is going to move to Bootsy uh, container images, um, and we plan on moving a lot of the cloud infrastructure to this. Right now, in the Fedora community, we're working with different products to um, make this happen. Um, so in Fedora and CentOS Stream, these are available as Fedora Boot C and CentOS Boot C images, and there is a rel Boot C 9.4 image available now. Um, but we see a lot of this activity is going on all over the place. I went to a great talk yesterday um, talking about uh, you know, Bluefin projects and um, some of the great stuff that's going on that. And that's all image mode too. And we're trying to do, uh, we're working with Fedora IoT, Fedora Core OS, and the um, Bluefin and um, Silver Blue teams to basically all coordinate on, let's get down to that one kernel module. And Matt's talk yesterday where he put up this, you know, his lovely hand drawings from, I don't know, it was seven or eight years ago. Um, this, this sort of plugs into that, right? So, 
it was 11 years ago? Oh, time flies. Uh, you know, but basically we're talking, you know, it's almost Fedora Core. We could have called this thing, instead of Bootsy, we could have called it Fedora Core. Uh, anyways, you know, so that we see all these projects coming and we're trying to consolidate everybody together on container technology. And then we can start to concentrate on new technologies um, for upgrading. So RHEL at Red Hat Summit announced that RHEL image mode is a co uh, way of doing RHEL. So this is all standard, going to be standard RHEL um, in the environment. So there'll be package mode for RHEL and then image mode for RHEL. But the basically, bottom line is they're both RHEL. They're just did different ways of delivering it. And we're planning on boot bootable container images going into OpenShift. Uh, but we believe this is the tip of the iceberg, that there's lots and lots of people out there doing things with image mode, and we're trying, we will hope that this thing takes off and becomes the standard way that people do uh, images. And we believe that this is a, you know, makes total sense. Uh, if you want to contribute, uh, we'd love to have more people looking at Bootsy and the Fedora images into the ecosystem. So we want people to start playing with this stuff and, and again, building up the whole Fedora image-based world uh, to use this type of system. Uh, we want to experiment and look at how, you know, th there are certain things that blow up when you go to image mode, because um, it's kind of somewhat opinionated, um, but a lot of stuff is problems and packages. So system D's developed really good tools for like handling how do I add users to these systems and things like that. So we want people to start thinking about how do we, how do we manage users on an image-based system. Um, we want to have config files uh, specification. We, we need to figure out how, we, how do we configure these systems um, better than what we're doing in the past. Um, we don't want to store any state in VAR. So the, the classic one is the Apache program. Apache uh, puts all its base content in VAR HTML, and it's been doing that for like 25, 30 years. What would be really nice, again, I think the talk yesterday was, we, was they mentioned that uh, how do I system reset, right? Imagine you, you have an edge device, you wanna pr press that button, that button that puts you back into the initial state. Well, one of the things you probably wanna do is remove all the files that are in var, all the files that are you know, in home and, and slash root. Um, but if our packages are actually dropping content into var, that's a problem. We need to get away from, from that type of activity. Um, we, want, we don't wanna require defaults in Etsy. Again, because we, in a perfect world, you could just RM slash RF of Etsy and have the system be able to recover from, from that state into a, a known good state. Um, bottom line is we want to test your workloads as, as container builds. So we want, you know, we want to make sure that all packages can be installed in this type of environment. A lot of packages assume things like system D is actually running. Well, if, when you, if you're doing it, in, say, if during install, you assume the system D is running, it probably is not going to be running in the container that you're doing in a, during a build, so that could cause failure. Um, there's working groups on this. Um, they were working on standards for you know how to how to do this packaging uh, with UKI, and a big thing that uh, came up a lot yesterday. If you move to image-based updates, uh, we need to make sure that these image-based updates aren't colossally large. So one of the things we're doing with RHEL AI right now is actually what RHEL AI is going to be based totally on um, bootable container images. And some of these images are 50 to 100 gigabytes. So if you are updating a 50 to 100 gigabyte file, um, that's, uh, that's going to be a heavy, uh, heavy toll on the network. Um, so ZSDD chunked, the Z standard chunked, is a, a method for inside of containers to only bring down individual files that changed in a layer as opposed to the entire layer. So when you're downloading, instead of having, you know, if only five files cha changed out of that 50 gigabytes, we'd only download those five, five files. And that's coming along, um, although as I've whined to several people in Fedora today, my, my pull request or my request to change uh, Fedora images to default to this was rejected. But I'll try again next week. <laughs> Finally, there's a new file system that's coming online. Oh, it's, it's in Linux kernel and in Fedora now called ComposeFS. And what ComposeFS can do is actually compose a file system out of existing file system objects. 
the really cool thing that you can do with this, you can start to move towards a somewhat immutable operating system. So for, for Rivos, for instance, Rivos, uh, Red Hat in vehicle operating system, what they care about is making sure that individual files on disk have not been modified. Um, so with Compose FS, we can actually start to actually take advantage of um, uh, FS Verity in the Linux kernel for an OS tree based operating system and able to compose a file system where if, if a either by hacker or an act of God, some file in the file system got modified, that the kernel would realize it and throw up an error. So there's lots and lots of technology, lots and lots of work going on in this environment. Um, and at this point, I'll open it up to questions, although you guys asked questions during it. So, yes. <laughs> file is bad, container file is better. Uh, but the, the problem I have with... Just the word. They're exactly the same. I know. And the, the problem I have is that in the example, we have DNF in the image. Yes. And it's clearly not needed in the image because the image is immutable right? sure. after it's been built. So we want tools to work from outside on a change route and, and modify stuff. Yeah. So we how, get, how to do that? So with... Um, I mean, we, we can argue about whether or not you want DNF inside of your image or not, uh, but containers have been dealing with this for a very long time, and containers have uh, multi, what they call multi-stage builds, um, so that you could do the DNF stuff all inside of it and then remove DNF from the, uh, at, it, at a different layer. Um, so you can do that, um, but in certain cases you might want DNF, because DNF has things like tell me what packages are installed, I mean, RPM does the same thing, but the, there, there are occasions that you might want DNF inside of it. Um, but. So I, I'm kind of wondering what happens with a per host configuration. So say I have a data center and I don't want DNS in it. Just something I can contrive quickly. Yeah, so you, you have control. You have control over what goes inside of Etsy if you want. But, um, but that would mean <laughs> every machine in the data center would have to reboot when I add a new machine? No. Because no, the host the only time are only a machine has to, up, uh, has to reboot is if you updated the image. Right, and I'd have to yeah. update um, Etsy hosts every time I add a host to the data center. It, it wouldn't be any different than what you have now. So, I, I mean, usually I, I would say use a DNS server or something like that. But you can, I, I know, you I, can upgrade, yeah. you can update the Etsy hosts on each one of the nodes outside. That doesn't have to be inside the image. But, but what, what about like um, Etsy host name, which is different on every host? Right, you can update those. Those, those are gonna get created at boot time. So they, they can be assigned per host, just oh, like so you do I have, a, I have an option of yeah, the Etsy, having the Etsy directory. At the Etsy, Etsy directory is not necessarily read-only, if that's what you're asking. <coughs> so you can put content in there, and that Etsy, that part of the system can drift. But the, the content that's inside slash user is going to be more static or more based on the image that you upgraded. Okay. So, yes. so what's the mechanism in this environment for the boot time customization? So the just what you have now, it's the same tooling. Yeah, it's just OS tree. So you can, e either the system's gonna upgrade those, update those files itself, or you could go in with something like Ansible or any other of your classic tools for modify, modifying your environment. So you still are gonna have some day two operations. Yeah. This is a follow on to Zibjek's thing. Um, I had heard from Colin at one point many months ago, so it may have changed, uh, that the plan was to extend DNF so that the administrative commands for boot C were just DNF subcommands. Um, is that still in the plans? That, um, I'm looking around, is Dave, Dave here? Yeah, he he <laughs> ran off when he saw you get yeah, on stage. He, <laughs> he said, I don't, I don't, I don't need to be here. So that's been our plan all along. We don't, we, we in a lot of ways, we. It would be really nice here is if you say DNF update on one of these systems that went out and did a Bootsy upgrade. And so the DNF becomes, you know, what you understand the DNF is, ends up being the commands to, to modify it. So you can use, you know, 
uh, different commands inside of DNF to manage an image-based system as well as a non-image. That's our request. We put in request to the D DNF team to do that. Anybody else? So um, a typical thing that um, is being done um, when you have a trouble to troubleshoot in, at day two operations, um, you might need to install additional software, right. like um, pick up the uh, SOS stuff and uh, sure. pick up the other things that support tells you to install and run and so on. How this would work in the uh, these kind of so environments? So OS Tree, which is a technology that's built onto, it has the capability to layer and allow you to run DNF commands, a DNF install on top of it. What it does is it mounts an overlay file system on top of the existing image and then allows you to add individual packages that you want at that time. Um, although this is kind of an anti-pad and we <laughs> really don't want people doing that. But yeah, yeah, so like S, you know, as you say, SOS tools or S-Trace and, and tools like that. Um, you could layer on top of it. But we want to treat it like an operate, like a containers again that if you later on upgrade whatever you lay it on top can be thrown away. Because um, really, it's sort of like rebasing an image to a new container. Um, so we want to get people to start thinking about that. But we understand that that's a big problem. And that's something that they've had a bolt on for OpenShift because they've had that Yeah, so th this yeah. is effectively a methodology change for support organizations. Yes. So there's this. Yeah, I mean, uh, potential to change in my, a lot. In my container world, I would say you run a privileged container to be able to do what you want to do. So I would run SOS inside of a container on top of one of these systems in privilege mode to allow it to examine the system. That that would be my preferred way, but I, it's going to be admins are not going to like. Yes, li and like living especially in, my world. in the cases yeah. where you need to um, modify, add debug statements, and and so on. Yeah. And we will have to examine all the uh, software that requires modifying mu immutable content uh, for, for doing right. these kind of debugging things. Yeah, but, I mean, a lot of this, uh, again, this OpenShift's been around for about 10 years, and they've been taking advantage in learning how to deal with these. And now we want people to start in the regular real world to, to My My to concern do. mostly about is software that never ran in OpenShift because it's too low or too... Right. And, and that's... What you call legacy stuff, which is actually what people sure. run in this. And one of the cool things here is that I guess I probably should have had Hans uh, jump up and say, wait a minute, you're telling me I have to package everything as containers. And, and no, we're not telling you that. So if you need a legacy application that you feel could never be containerized, you can do a DNF install or a yep. add inside of your build of your OS image, and that would be standard content. It would not be running inside of a container on the operating system. So we are moving um, to legalize anti-patterns. Yes. Wasn't it supposed to be with the container thing, layering would be better because now layering is just going to be a new container, a new layer in the container, as opposed yeah, to so, Yeah, you're not supposed to be shouting out questions without the microphone, so. Yeah. The, uh, the so, so the question he asked is, is should, shouldn't this be layering? So the, the question we asked about adding a package on to to be able to do debug. Theoretically, you could have you in a pure container world, you would push out a new image with the SOS tool in it, and then you would do a Bootsy upgrade to get the SOS tool in it. I think most people are going to think that's too big a pain. To, yeah. to, to, to well, you can do that locally on the same machine because it doesn't change anything. You need to, to right. have Podman, right. uh, and that's all. And you can enable that layer which you erase much yeah. clearly. So it's it's a nice yeah. kind of approach to, to the problem, more clear also from the support point of view because they yeah. have clear delineation of what is being modified on the customer system. That's that's really a good point going forward. Yep. Yeah. There's one more over here, Doc. Uh, there's, okay. But the root is better this way, so. Um, from what you just said, if I'm understanding correctly, 
if I have a layered image SOS built on top of Fedora Boot C, if the kernel changed in Fedora Boot C, I have to build SOS image before I'm doing the Boot C upgrade. Is that right? Uh, ask the question. I, I, you ask the question again. Okay. Uh, I have a layered image, SOS, built on top of Fedora Bootsy. Right. If kernel changed in Fedora Bootsy image, do I have to rebuild my SOS image? Yes. So if you have, if you, um, if, ooh, I don't know why this has done that, but yeah, if you, basically if the boot, bootable image changes so that the Fedora Bootsy or the RHEL Bootsy yep. image changes, you would, just like you would do any other container image, you need to rebuild your entire image, push that to a registry, and now all of your, your 100 nodes will see the update in the registry okay. and will download the updated kernel. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Hello and welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, a lot of the the, um, the the talk for uh, Atomic Linux and what have you, Universal Blue and Bluefin, yep. um, those have been examples that have helped to popularize the concept, but they've also been desktop-focused implementations of the technology. My question, because I'm curious, and I don't know if, if you would know or how much this is getting talked about, but w w when you mentioned the use cases that Red Hat is exploring for this as like a solution for, for those spaces, um, has this, uh, changed uh, or, or, or maybe um, like, like brought up the idea of like, what, what, how does Red Hat maybe ad address the desktop use case um, and have that be something that's happening from Red Hat's side as opposed to just whatever's uh, developing within Fedora? I, I think, don't know if that's a thing. I mean, Red Hat, <laughs> probably got to watch myself very carefully. <laughs> Uh, so Red Hat up to this point has, has basically looked at, you know, we have, uh, this is a small desktop business inside of Red Hat. Um, there, so there are people that use uh, Red Hat desktops. But I think, I think we're watching, I think the, guy, the people working on, um, you know, Silver Blue and, and the down, downstream packages are showing some, some um, interesting stuff going on. So I, I don't think anybody in Red Hat's ready to make the leap and say, you know, is there a business that we can sell um, supported desktop operating systems based on this technology? But I think that's that's one part. You know, if 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 you guys uh, keep showing promise in this thing and building upstream communities around it and it becomes very very popular, then I think it would be something Red Hat could potentially could potentially you know look at. Um, so, thank you. Is that Millie Melth enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's awesome. Um, so my question is, um, which addresses actually another question, um, that something that the Universal Blue Project has been exploring, which this is very early days, not something that uh, we have done in any of our images up to this point, but is showing promise as the idea of system D systems extensions. Um, yeah. Has the team looked at that as a potential solution for the problem that we were talking about? That we know it's an anti-pattern, obviously, to right. you know install software on top of a container-based image workload, but it could solve certain problems with the size of containers that you can have at a certain point when you start putting all of the stuff in there. I, 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 we're looking very closely at. at you know, stuff that Leonard and, and uh, the System D guys are, are I mean, guys and gals, um, as we found out today, uh, are, are working on. And um, I, I don't know specifically about what you're talk, talking about is going to get it added, um, but we are following those. Uh, we will be participating in all systems go in, in the fall. I think the key difference from us is we are trying to say, the container ecosystem has won, right? It's it's the and anything that isn't based off of the way people deal with containers is is going to be a one-off project. And really, what we want to do is we want to participate with within the container ecosystem and and make this easy for people to adopt. 
Um, and w there's a lot of assumptions. At Red Hat Summit, we talk to a lots and lots of, of customers, and we had the assumption that you know, sysadmin understood the container world, you know, and that, you know, in a lot of cases proved to be incorrect. Uh, but I think in the long run, consolidating the way people are build, building apps and with the way they're building operating systems into a single uh, workflow is, is, is a winner, winning idea. Um, so. Awesome. Thank you. This is, you're getting your exercise. I'm telling you, I'm people. This close to time you have to, to coordinate it, raising the hands and not be across the room every time. And I should have done a longer presentation because this is way too many questions, and I still got. Uh, Sorry, Dan. Uh, so, uh, given that you said that uh, we're starting to ship Bootsy uh, con uh, container images to the public now, right? You said there's a Run 9.4 Bootsy image somewhere out there which contains a kernel. Is it correct then that this is like the first time that Red Hat is issuing, is publishing binary kernels uh, to the public anonymously, basically non-customers? Did you use the word anonymously? Well, yeah. Yeah, so that, that would be a mistake on your part. Okay. These, you have to have a Red Hat, in order to get the RHEL image, you have to have a RHEL subscription. So you can't go to the registry without a RHEL subscription and download that image. Okay, good. So this is still the same rules as we had, like UBI lacked the kernel on purpose for, for the longest time, so that, that policy is yeah, still the, in, the, in play? The, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so UBI is a subset of the entire RHEL packages. Right, but that is available to, to people yeah. to download right now. No. Uh, okay. right, you can download UBI, you cannot download the RHEL 9 image without, without showing proof of subscription. Okay, thank you. Yep. Someone over there? Uh, probably. Yeah, it's this size. To, to, are we? <laughs> oh, God. I'm tired I, just watching I, you. I, I'm back to thinking about the layered image thing. If, uh, if you have, what if you have two things you want to layer? You've got, you know, say the um, SOS report, and you also want Chrome, like things that don't run well in containers, and you've got to put them there. Like. Can you put things side by side in easy way? I mean, the container model is basically stacked one on top of the other, right? Correct. There's not yeah. like a way to install two. No, it's just, any... it's just a container model. So you, okay. I mean, you'd either install them both in the same layer or, or you would layer on top. I feel like we need that, but, but I mean, usually, a different problem. I don't think SOS is a really, that, yeah, uh, that's what, probably something you don't want to have installed on every single system. That, that would probably be most likely just a, a temporary layer that you would add on. Yeah. But you would have, yeah, if you wanted, to say, a desktop version of your operating system, right. you'd, be, you know, you'd use something like Silver Blue, and that, that would pull in all the packages for what it would mean to be a desktop operating system. Yeah, I may be wrong, and we should check this with Colin, but my understanding is the way this is, I don't know how well this works yet, but the idea is that the RPM OS tree tooling will help you with this. So when you do an RPM OS tree rebase, instead of doing all the overlay FS stuff, it will create a new container image layer for you, like a local one. And now your system is running that. And to address the question from Mohan earlier, the tooling would also, with the base image updated, it would know that you were running an overlay layer and rebuild all the way up so that the next time you rebooted, you would have your overlay layers on top of the base yeah. layer. So it, that's going to be like an intermediary. And again, I may be wrong, but that was just I my think, understanding. I think you might be over-promising, but yes. Well, I, I don't I, know if it's, it's going to happen, yeah, but it was yeah. the idea <laughs> that's that the, I heard. That's the goal. Right, right. Well, yeah. Not so that, that was the, the glorious vision anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? We're done. Good. Thanks, Dan. Thanks.